This is part three of our video from vectors to multivectors. See the video description below for links to parts one and two and other useful information. Getting back to our construction of G of V, recall that the vectors E1 to En form an orthonormal basis for V. That means any one vector can be written as a linear combination of these basis vectors. Also note the convention that an E with multiple subscripts means the geometric product of the basis vectors with those subscripts, and we define E null to be one. We're allowed to multiply any two objects in G of V, so let's briefly explore what happens when we multiply a bivector to a vector in the same plane. In this case, we'll use a unit bivector to avoid scaling the result. And since these two particular objects anti-commute, we'll have to pay attention to the order. Here we see that multiplying a vector v in the span of e1 and e2 by the unit bivector e12 on the right yields a 90 degrees clockwise rotation. Multiplying again by e12 on the right would rotate it another 90 degrees clockwise, yielding minus v, effectively the same as multiplying the original vector by negative 1. So the result noted in part 2 about e12 squaring to negative 1 is less surprising now that it's recognized as a necessity. A more powerful treatment of rotational dynamics will be presented in a future video. This was just to give you a sense of why matching signature bivectors square negative. Taking a look now at some specific geometric algebras, beginning with R2, the bivector E12 is the highest grade object we can form. So multivectors of G2 are linear combinations of these basis elements, and that's as far as we can take it. But if we started with R3, our multivector basis for G3 would look like this, and so on. Note that general multivectors in G3, which are in the span of this set, have scalar, vector, bivector, and trivector components. Observe that G01 is structurally equivalent to the complex numbers, and G02 turns out to be the quaternions. As complex numbers are very helpful for rotations in the plane, quaternions, which were discovered in 1843 by the Irish mathematician Sir William Rowan Hamilton, are the go-to tool for three-dimensional rotations for many programmers working in computer graphics. This is a neat result but we'll soon see more geometrically insightful interpretations of complex numbers and quaternions as particular subalgebras of G3. By the way, if you haven't heard the recent a cappella science song, William Rowan Hamilton, do that. It's an absolutely brilliant parody of the opening song of the musical Hamilton. I'll include a link to this in the video description below. Moving on, define GPQ sub K to be the set of all K vectors in GPQ. For example, G3 sub 0 is R. G3 sub 1 is our vector space R3, G3 sub 2 is our set of bivectors, and G3 sub 3 is our set of trivectors, called pseudoscalars in G3, since they are all scalar multiples of E1, 2, 3. Thus, an element in G3 can be decomposed into the sum of scalar, vector, bivector, and trivector components. Assuming the pseudoscalars are not scalars, an assertion I only need to make for spaces where pseudoscalars square positive and commute, what is the dimension of GPQ? Here I'll assume some familiarity with combinatorics from the viewer. The number of basis k vectors generated from an n-dimensional vector space is n choose k. So the dimension of GPQ is n choose 0 plus n choose 1 plus n choose 2 and so on up to n choose n. And, by a well-known combinatorial result, this sum of the binomial coefficients, which are also the entries in the nth row of Pascal's triangle, is equal to 2 to the nth power. Another important subset to define is the linear span of the even grade multivector basis elements, called the even subalgebra of GPQ. For example, elements of the even subalgebra of G7 are only allowed to have scalar, bivector, four vector, and six vector components. The dimension of the even subalgebra is half the dimension of the original multivector space. So in our example of G7, the even subalgebra has dimension 2 to the sixth, or 64. The geometric product of multivectors that only have even grade terms results in a multivector that only has even grade terms. So, as the name suggests, this subset of GPQ is in fact a subalgebra. Finally, the center of GPQ, meaning the set of objects in GPQ that commute with everything in the space, only contains the scalars when the dimension is even, but also includes the pseudoscalars when the dimension is odd. Returning to our consideration of G3, Define lowercase i to be the unit pseudoscalar E123. It turns out little i commutes with everything in G3, and it squares to negative 1. So the center of G3 is isomorphic to the complex numbers. Next, set capital IJK to be these basis bivectors. Notice they satisfy the defining equation of the quaternions that Hamilton carved into a bridge in Dublin in what's been described as a famous act of mathematical vandalism. So the quaternions are seen as the even subalgebra of G3 and so-called pure quaternions are just bivectors. 
As an added benefit, vectors, quaternions, and complex numbers are all contained in this one unified system. Also notice that the product of the pseudoscalar i with the unit bivectors i, j, and k yield the basis vectors e1, e2, and e3 in a process known as duality. So it turns out that g3 is isomorphic to the algebraic system known as biquaternions. And regarding the cross product of vector algebra, multiplying the cross product of two vectors by the pseudoscalar i yields the outer product of those vectors. Hence, the cross product and outer product in G3 are related by duality. The next fascinating point of unification we'll discuss involves the Pauli algebra, a complex 2x2 two two matrix algebra for spin 1 half particles, like electrons, quarks, neutrinos, etc. It's generated by these basis elements, used in the Pauli equation, which is a non-relativistic reformulation of the Schrodinger equation that takes into account the interaction of particle spin with an external electromagnetic field. Matrix algebra is an associative algebra. These sigma basis elements anti-commute with each other and square to the identity matrix I2. So this exotic complex matrix algebra from quantum mechanics turns out to be identical to the geometric algebra of standard three-dimensional Euclidean space. If these particles are moving at relativistic speeds, the Dirac equation involving these gamma matrices are introduced. Notice this connection between the Dirac and Pauli matrices. It turns out these matrices anti-commute gamma 0 squares to the identity matrix I4, while gammas 1 through 3 square to minus the identity matrix. So the Dirac algebra turns out to be identical to the geometric algebra of spacetime using the 1, 3 signature. To emphasize the connection to the Dirac matrices, we'll use gamma 0 through 3 instead of E1 through 4 for the basis 1 vectors of G1, 3, also known as spacetime algebra. When generating an orthonormal one-vector basis in spacetime algebra, choosing a particular time-like vector gamma naught is identifying a particular inertial reference frame, say, the lab frame. From that four-element orthonormal one-vector basis, we generate our 16-element multi-vector basis for spacetime algebra. Objects and experimenters moving non-relativistically with respect to the lab frame, defined by our choice of gamma naught, experience the approximate Newtonian world of G3, resulting from taking spacetime bivectors as our basis one-vectors, like so. Conveniently, the lowercase i defined as the pseudoscalar for G3 is the same pseudoscalar in spacetime algebra, though it anti-commutes with the odd grade elements of G13. Noting these duality relations between the sigma bivectors and the remaining bivector basis elements, we can rewrite the multivector basis of spacetime algebra like this. Notice that mixed signature bivector square to positive one and these sigmas anti-commute. So the even subalgebra of spacetime algebra generated by the sigmas can be reinterpreted as G3 having scalar, vector, bivector, and trivector components. Summing up the examples we considered, start with the spacetime algebra G13. The even subalgebra obtained by the process just described, called the spacetime split, results in the geometric algebra of the familiar Euclidean 3 space. Taking the even subalgebra of G3 results in the quaternions. Interpreting the quaternions as G02 and taking its even subalgebra results in the complex numbers. Interpreting the complex numbers as G01 and taking its even subalgebra results in the real numbers. And that's where I'll end this video, with this fascinating Matryoshka doll type situation with geometric algebras.